Good morning, Magic. I'm Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. And today I'm going to talk with you about something you probably never think about, and that is Magic code names. I get asked every now and then how we refer to sets internally, and the answer is these code names. But what is the history of them? What do they look like? And what are they even? Well, let me tell you all about it today. In the beginning, Magic sets didn't have code names. You had, of course, the first set, what we call Alpha now, which who knows if there were even going to be more Magic sets at the time, so it didn't have a code name. And then after that, sets like Arabian Nights and Antiquities and Legends, those were just codenamed whatever the set was actually going to be. It was going to be a set about the Arabian Nights? Well, it was Arabian Nights. A set about Legends? Well, hey, how about Legends? But this all changed with alliances. It was decided that sets should have code names. That way you could name the set whatever codename you wanted now, and then give it a real name once the set was fully formed. That way the codename wasn't actually informing the design decisions. Also, names have a tendency to grow on you. What might start as a not great name over time has the tendency to become normal. And then by the time you're releasing the set, you're like, yeah, of course, that's a great set name. When in reality, you could do something much better. Now the very first code names were extremely silly and very of the time. They were all named after Macintosh sound files. Why? Because at the time, all of R&D used Mac computers, and each folder containing a set would be set to have that sound file play when you opened it. So when you opened up the folder for alliances, you would hear a quack. quack. So we started off with alliances, which was codenamed Quack, followed by a Mirage, which was codenamed Susumi, and then we only got two sets in before we hit a problem that we still run into today sometimes. A new set will show up out of nowhere for whatever reason, and suddenly it breaks a previous codename structure. In this case, Mirage had so many awesome cards it could be split into two sets, and so we needed another set that was in the same world as Mirage. So Mirage gave birth to Mirage Jr., which was Visions. And so it continued from there, with all kinds of one-off codenames that got progressively weirder and wackier. For example, Exodus was codenamed Gorgonzola, and Ursa Saga was codenamed Armadillo. But then, with Mercadian Masks block, everything changed. Instead of using one-off codenames that were weird and difficult to remember, instead, each block of three sets would have a name for each set that were all connected together. So for example, Mercadian Masks was Greek names. You had Archimedes, Euripides, and Dionysus as the three names of those sets. The next block, Invasion, were three cities that all had Chinese names. There was Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. The block after that, Odyssey block, had Argon, Boron, and Carbon as three elements. And that unlocked kind of a new take of having three things that were all not only connected together, but went in a set order. So you could easily understand which set was which when you were talking about it. And so that gave birth to things like bacon, lettuce, and tomato for the three sets of Mirden block, or earth, wind, and fire for the three sets of Kamigawa block. And it stayed this way for a very long time. There were, as always, a few curveballs thrown in the way. For example, when Lorwyn and Shadowmoor became two different blocks of two sets apiece, it turned from peanut butter jelly into peanut butter jelly and donut for eventide. The first block I got to work on at Wizards was hook, line, and sinker block, which was Return to Ravnica. I have to say that my least favorite set of codenames was probably Cons of Tarkir, which were Huey, Dewey, and Louie. First of all, you had to remember which order these very similar sounding names went in, which I was able to do as a child of the 90s, fortunately. But to make things more difficult, you had this time travel thing where you would draft the first and the second set together, and the second and the third set together. So you'd be invited to a Huey Dewey draft and a Louie Dewey draft, and then maybe you'd go to a Dewey meeting, and it was very complicated to keep which ones they were in mind. But after 10 years, Cons of Tarkir would be the last block to use this style of three name code names. Why? Because we're moving into a world of two set blocks. So the ones that we still had were retrofitted to those blocks. For example, Blood, Sweat, and Tears became Blood and Sweat for Battle for Zendikar block, and Tears and Fears for Shadows over Innistrad block. So then by the time we got to Ixalan, we had a new convention in place. Every two set block would have names named after foods, and they would go in order of the time of day you would eat those meals. So for example, you had Ham and Eggs, which would be Ixalan, followed by Soup and Salad, followed by Spaghetti and Meatballs, followed by Milk and Cookies. Easy, right? Well, it was all thrown out of whack almost immediately. 
ham and eggs went off without a hitch, but then we ended up changing the second set of Dominaria into a core set. So, well, salad went away and now there's just soup. And the subsequent year, spaghetti and meatball stayed the same, which were guilds of Ravnica and Ravnica Allegiance. And then you had milk, which was War of the Spark, but cookies existed no longer and became a core set. And then something new happened again. We were moving away from the two set block structure into individual sets where every set was its own large set. And this meant we would need a whole new naming structure. So Mark Rosewater took the task of figuring out what this naming convention could be. And it had a few requirements. It needed to be easy to remember, they needed to be related, and there should be a lot of them. So we could kind of go for a very long time. And he came back with something that worked out great, sports. So starting with Throne of Eldraine, every standard set is the name of a sport, and they go in alphabetical order. So for example, Throne of Eldraine was archery, Theros was baseball, Akoria was cricket, Zendikar was diving, Kaldheim was equestrian. And now, that brings us to today, with Strixhaven, which was fencing. But what about ancillary sets, you might ask? What about the battle bonds and conspiracies and commander legends of the world? Well, that's pretty straightforward. They're just given the code name that the architect decides to give them. Often what's in a good code name is something that will make sure that it's obfuscated, so if you say it, it isn't immediately clear what it is, but has enough of a hint of the thing in it that it makes sense, that if you are on the inside and you hear it, you kind of understand what's going on. So for example, Conspiracy was codenamed Hydra because it was a mini player draft with mini heads like a Hydra that you would play with. But if you heard Hydra outside of Wizards, well, it wouldn't really mean anything to you. I will say though, that was not a great code name because at the same time, we ended up working on the Theros Hydra Challenge deck, which was very confusing, but that's a story for another time. In fact, if you want, let's play a little game. I'm going to show you a list of code names in alphabetical order. I'm also going to show you a list of sets in alphabetical order. Can you guess which code name goes with which set? Ready and go. And there you go, a brief history of code names. It'll probably never impact you, but it's kind of fun to know about nonetheless. Do you have any questions about code names or one that you're wondering about? Let me know in the comments down below. I'll talk with you again on Wednesday. And in the meantime, may you have a lot of fun naming your stuff. You got this. Another team that got an award this year, our Cinematics team. And they created the aptly named Cinematic Phoenix. The Cinematics team is behind our incredible trailers. And if you were following 2019, you would have seen both our War of the Spark trailer and our Throne of Eldraine trailer, which had more eyes on them than ever before. And even people who weren't playing Magic were watching.